This is BBC World News America. Funding of this presentation is made possible by the Freeman Foundation, Newman's Own Foundation, giving all profits from Newman's Own to charity and pursuing the common good, Kovler Foundation, pursuing solutions for America's neglected needs, and Hong Kong Tourism Board. Tell me, sweet little love, Want to know Hong Kong's most romantic spots? I'll show you. I love heading to Repulse Bay for an evening stroll. It's a perfect, stunning backdrop for making romantic moments utterly unforgettable. I've lived in this city for years, but Hong Kong still makes me fall in love with it time and again. And now, BBC World News America. This is BBC World News America reporting from Washington. I'm Katty Kay. More U.S. Special Forces are on their way to Syria and Iraq. Their job is to undermine Islamic State militants. Far from Paris, in the heart of the American West, they worry about climate change. But across this nation, coal miners don't want to limit fossil fuels. And millions of years ago, they walked the earth. Now the footprints of dinosaurs have been discovered in Scotland. So each one of these circular indentations was made by the foot of a sauropod. Those are those trunk-legged, long-necked giants, and they used to roam here 170 million years ago. Welcome to our viewers on public television here in America and also around the globe. Despite its reluctance to put more American troops into the chaos of the Middle East, the Obama administration today revealed plans to do just that. Defense Secretary Ash Carter told Congress more U.S. Special Forces will be heading to Iraq and Syria. He wouldn't specify numbers, but said the troops would conduct raids and gather intelligence. The American move comes as the British Parliament prepares to vote on whether to join airstrikes in Syria. The BBC's Gary O'Donoghue has the latest. Political and military chiefs are promising to intensify the fight against Islamic State and today some members of Congress wanted to know whether it was working. Are we winning, Mr. Secretary? Uh, we will win. Uh, are we winning now? We're going to win. Large numbers of ground troops are still off the agenda. But the Pentagon is now planning to increase the numbers of special forces, not just in Syria, but also in Iraq, to help conduct raids, rescue hostages, and kill IS leaders. This is an important capability because it takes advantage of what we're good at. We're good at intelligence, we're good at mobility, we're good at surprise, we're, we have the long reach that no one else has. And it puts everybody on notice in uh, Syria. That you, you don't know at night who's going to be coming in the window. Fifty such special forces have already been announced for northern Syria, but... We're prepared to do more. I have every reason to believe the president will allow us to do more and authorize us to do more when we have more opportunities. The U.S. also wants its allies to do more, particularly Turkey, which is embroiled in a standoff with Russia over the downing of a jet last week. Just today, Russia imposed a list of trade sanctions on Turkey in protest over the incident. On the fringe of the Paris Climate Summit, the President urged reconciliation and called on Russia to change course. Ultimately, Russia is going to recognize the threat that ISIL poses to uh, its country, to its people, uh, is the most significant and that they need to align themselves with those of us who are fighting ISIL. After the IS-sponsored attacks in Paris, there's renewed pressure from the US on coalition members to do more. Germany's cabinet has just approved up to 1,200 troops to join the effort. And on Wednesday, the British Parliament will vote on whether to extend airstrikes into Syria. Gary O'Donoghue, BBC News. Well, one of the American lawmakers who was questioning the Secretary of Defense today was Democratic Congressman Seth Moulton. He's an Iraq War veteran, and he joined me from Capitol Hill a short time ago. Moulton, what did you make of what Ash Carter was proposing today? 
Well, it's clear that the administration <coughs> has realized that we need to do more, that we need to have a more serious strategy. My concern is that we don't have a real long-term plan, a plan to ensure the peace, not just to win the military victory on the ground. You have said that for Russian pilots, it's very clear what their mission is. Their mission is to shore up President Assad. But you're not clear that American troops are going into Iraq and into Syria with the same clarity. What's the problem? That's right. And I asked Secretary Carter what the mission statement was, and he didn't give a very clear answer. Now, I asked the same question of Chairman Dunford, General Dunford of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he gave a very clear mission statement for his commander on the ground in Iraq, but it didn't include anything about the political follow-on. And the lesson that we learned from the Iraq War is that if we don't have an in a plan to ensure the, p the peace, a plan to make sure that our actions there are sticky, to use a term that uh, Secretary Carter used this morning, then we will find ourselves back in that mess once again. I followed up that question to General Dunford by saying if we had stayed integrated into Iraqi politics, would we be in the mess that we are in today? And he said, no, we would not. Okay, so just to be clear, Congressman, you were part of the surge of U.S. forces in Iraq. Are you suggesting we need more American troops there now or less American troops there now? No, I do not think that we need more American troops than we had in the surge, uh, nowhere even close to that number. What we but need more than to we have ha currently, more than 3,500 we have currently? Well, perhaps, but the first thing that we need is a serious political plan. That means a political plan to fill the vacuums that ISIS has been able to occupy. You know, if you think about it, when ISIS had this dramatic expansion from Syria into western and then into northern Iraq, they didn't just defeat the Iraqi army. The Iraqi army put their weapons down and went home because they had lost faith in their own government. Well, you don't fix Iraqi politics just by training Iraqi troops. And when I brought this up with the secretary and the chairman, they said this is a key question. I wasn't convinced, though, that they have a very clear answer. Do you think there's a clear answer to a political solution in Syria? I think it's very difficult, but I think that we need to be clear about what our goals are. And to your point, that's what Russia has been able to do. I, I hate to use them as a counterexample here, uh, but they have been very clear with their troops and with everybody what their political mission is in Syria. It's to keep Assad in power. We've got to be equally clear with our political mission. And we have to do the same thing in Iraq as well. Now, the secretary today said that in Iraq, the mission will be to uh, reestablish the strength of a unity, a unified Iraqi government. So in contrast, for example, to some who have called for plans to split up the Iraqi state into three different component parts. But we've got to make sure that happens. We've got to have the political and diplomatic muscle to ensure that happens. That's not about putting more troops on the ground. That's about having a robust presence in Iraqi politics, in the Iraqi government, like we had during the surge when we had advisors in the prime minister's office, in the ministries. That's when we had the Iraqi government on, on track. When we pulled those advisors out, the government went off the rails and allowed ISIS to come in. Okay, Congressman Seth Moulton, thanks very much for joining me. Thank you. Okay, so that's the latest from here in America where the Pentagon has announced plans to send more special forces to the region. But five years into the civil war in Syria, what is the view from Damascus itself? The BBC's chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette, is there and I spoke to her just a short time ago. Lise, you've been to Damascus many times, but it was before the Russians stepped in to help the Syrian government. Do you detect a change for the Assad regime since you were there last? Uh, certainly, the intervention of Russia in September has made a, a clear difference here for President Assad's forces because if you look at the record of the airstrikes, it's clear that in the initial weeks they weren't targeting the so-called Islamic State. They were targeting opposition forces, the Syrian opposition, in parts of the country where Syrian army was under huge pressure. And that has helped uh, President Assad to regain some ground and to regain some confidence. But we also understand that when President Assad went for a rare trip outside the country to visit Moscow, it was made clear to him that there now had to be a much greater effort to try to find a negotiated way out of this war, that the Russians weren't giving him a blank check. 
But as you can see, if you've seen the recent interview given by President Assad today to Czech television, when he talks about the Syrian opposition, he says, yes, of course, we are interested in dialogue. But then his contemptuous tone creeps in, in which he and his supporters, they do exist here, believe there is still no credible alternative to the Syrian leader because the opposition remains deeply divided. And I have to say that, you know, having been to uh, some of the Saudi capitals, some of the Arab capitals recently, which have been among the most implacable opponents of President Assad, they, now mindful of the chaos across this region, are saying that when the transition starts, and they hope it starts soon, it must start with President Assad to prevent a precipitous collapse, but it must end without him. The question is, who will replace him and at what point in that process? And those questions are by no means clear. So, so I mean, given that balance there between the Assad regime feeling boosted by Russia but realizing that there's going to be a transition, is there more confidence now in the Assad regime or less about the long-term future? What their main allies, Russia and Iran, say publicly and privately um, is that they're not wedded to President Assad, that they are willing to accept an alternative, but what they put to the Americans, to other Western powers, to Arab states, they say, what is your alternative? And even some of the Arab states back in the opposition recognize now that there isn't a credible alternative yet to the president, and they know that. So when you speak to the government and you say, Say, are you going to send a delegation to any talks? They'll say we were ready yesterday. But when they get to the talks, what they want, what they're willing to speak about, and how they see this process, they don't accept it's a transition. But they, their views on how it will move forward are still at odds with both Moscow, Tehran, and all of the opposition forces. Okay, Lise Dusset in Damascus for us. Lise, thanks very much. So, on the evening before the British Parliament votes on whether to join those airstrikes in Syria, there are a lot of moving parts, diplomatic and military, around the situation in Syria. Now, news from around the rest of the world. Indonesian investigators say that a faulty computer connection and the crew's inability to fix the problem caused an airplane to crash into the Java Sea last December. All 162 people on board were killed. The soldering on a system that controlled the rudder was found to be cracked and had malfunctioned repeatedly. The mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel, has dismissed the city's police chief following renewed protests about the killing of a black teenager in October of last year. A police officer who has been charged with first-degree murder was released on Monday on a $1.5 million bond. Video from the dashboard camera of a police car was released last week showing 17-year-old Laquan McDonald walking away as he was shot 16 times. Cuba has reinstated restrictions on doctors leaving the island to work in the United States and other countries. A statement published in the state-run newspaper says that Cuba's health services have been seriously affected by the great number of doctors who've moved abroad since travel restrictions were eased two years ago. It also criticized an American policy aimed at recruiting Cuban doctors and other health care workers. Today, President Obama said that he is positive the world can hammer out a significant deal at the climate change summit in Paris. He called global warming an economic and security imperative. But the Republican-controlled Congress here is challenging the president's attempts to reduce carbon emissions from power plants. Our North America editor, John Sopel, has more. In America, where everything is big, even nature seems outsized. The magnificent Yosemite National Park in summer, a tourist location, but year-round, California's water source. The trouble is, for the past few years, the snowfall has been a dusting, not a dump. The waterfalls are a trickle of their cascading best. The state has been suffering one of its worst ever droughts, affecting wildlife, affecting business, affecting livelihoods. For living here and working here, I've noticed more and more of the trees are affected, the waterfalls are drying earlier, the river level is going down. In fact, before the storm, just a couple of weeks ago, the river level was probably the lowest I've ever seen it. California is leading the way in championing alternative, cleaner sources of energy. This factory near San Francisco makes solar panels, but it's the business pitch which is interesting. Given the choice of paying less for clean energy, or more for dirty energy, most customers will pay less for clean energy. And, that, and that's our business model, make it super easy for somebody to go solar 
there's no investment, they don't pay for the equipment, they don't pay for the installation. They only pay for the electricity. If you think storm damage is the only cost of climate change, think again. Even though the presidential election is a year away, TV ads have already started appearing to shape the political debate on both sides. A billionaire businessman and the biggest donor to the Democratic Party is funding these ones. People say every election, this is the most important election ever. In this case, we, we think this is the election for energy and climate, that we really have to get it right. We don't have, you know, time to waste. This is a global problem. Let's be part of the leadership that moves the world to the right place. It is mined locally, electricity is made locally, but we can distribute it through our transmission lines across the United States. But across the country, in the Appalachian Mountains, coal is still king. From the mines to the power stations, tens of thousands are employed in the industry, supplying millions on the eastern seaboard who rely on it for their energy. And the Obama plan to cut greenhouse gas emissions from US power stations by nearly a third within 15 years is being fiercely resisted. We think it'll be a devastating impact. Uh, you know, we've had seven years of uh, devastating impact from this administration. The clean power plan, or the costly power plan, as uh, we uh, think it, it should be referred to as, is, uh, you know, it's just not good for America. In the immediate term, lobbyists for coal are planning a full-on legal challenge. And then there's the longer-term political battle. Irrespective of what happens in Paris, the future of coal-fired power plants like this one is not yet settled. Republicans in the Senate have already voted to reject Barack Obama's CO2 emissions plan. That doesn't matter as long as there's a Democrat in the White House. But were that to change next year in the elections, then everything will be up for grabs. John Sopel, BBC News, West Virginia. America's political and economic battle with how to reduce emissions. You're watching BBC World News American still to come on this program. Gene editing could be the future of treating disease, but it's not without controversy. We take you inside this contentious debate. A Japanese fleet has left for the Antarctic with a plan to kill hundreds of whales in defiance of an international court ruling. Japan says it hunts whales in the Antarctic for scientific reasons, but that claim was rejected by the International Court of Justice last year. Rupert Wingfield Hayes has the story. In previous years, the Japanese whaling fleet has left port before dawn to avoid clashes with anti-whaling protesters. But this morning they were confident enough to hold a small ceremony in the winter sunshine before boarding their ships and slowly slipping out of the port of Shimonoseki. Down the side of each vessel in large English letters, the word research. With the harpoons on their bows, this fleet will aim to kill 333 minke whales in Antarctic waters. But Japan says it is all in the pursuit of science. As proof, it's released video of previous hunts showing crew butchering and then measuring different parts of the whales they've caught. But last year the International Court of Justice in The Hague ruled that these whale hunts have produced no valuable scientific data. Instead the judges said Japan's scientific whaling program is little more than commercial whaling in disguise. So why is Japan still doing it? In part it's cultural. Whale meat has long been part of the Japanese diet. In the 1950s and 60s, it was the biggest source of meat for a hungry nation. But today, hardly anyone here eats whale, and those that do are mostly elderly. It is only government money that keeps this hunt going, and politicians who believe Japan should not be told by foreigners what it can and can't eat. Rupert Wingfield Hayes, BBC News in Tokyo. Gene editing, that's the ability to manipulate our DNA, is set to transform our knowledge of human biology. But it's also raising ethical questions. The technology is moving fast, and one day it could help cure inherited genetic conditions. But should there be limits on how far we can go to edit our genes? The promise and the peril are being discussed here in Washington, as our medical correspondent Fergus Walsh now reports. 
Just a day old with a lifetime of opportunity ahead, this baby has been born into a world set to be transformed by a stunning advance in genetics, the ability to precisely manipulate our DNA. How we grow and develop is shaped by DNA, which sits in the nucleus of our cells. It's an instruction manual for how our bodies work, written in a chemical code of just four letters. Key sections are called genes. A spelling mistake can trigger disease. But now scientists have discovered a cheap and easy way to correct such errors by editing the code. Think of gene editing as a molecular sat-nav. It scans the DNA, searching for the error. Then it uses molecular scissors to snip through both strands, which switches off the faulty gene. Or it can repair the code by inserting a healthy copy of the gene. These techniques raise the prospect of treating, even curing, some genetic diseases. And it's not science fiction. Last month, we heard about one-year-old Layla, whose leukemia was fixed by doctors in London who gave her gene-edited immune cells. The technology could eventually be used to treat scores of genetic conditions, like Sahana's. A faulty gene means her skin constantly blisters. It is incredibly painful and can prove fatal. This technology holds the unimaginable dream of a cure. We really do have a hope that we can specifically correct Sahana's cells and um, give her a chance at a life. The Breakthrough Prize is awarded to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. The scientists who invented a cheap and rapid new gene editing system just three years ago have already been showered with awards and labs across the world are using their technology. So what is the potential of gene editing? And in the future, we hope that this will be a technology that can actually be used not only to understand disease, but also to cure it. We can actually change the DNA. So not only understand the information in the cell, but actually do something about it. If we see a mutation that causes disease, we have now the potential uh, technology to, uh, to fix it. That could help patients with a whole range of genetic conditions. Their faulty cells could be removed, treated in the lab, and then healthy versions reinfused in the body. But could this science go too far? If gene editing was done in embryos, then any DNA changes would pass down the generations. The hot issue at this meeting is whether scientists should even be allowed to do research to modify the genes of embryos. Or is it a step too far that might lead to designer humans? Fergus Walsh, BBC News, Washington. The science is mind-boggling. Now, there is very big news today from the world of paleontology. More than a hundred rare footprints of huge plant-eating dinosaurs have been found on the Isle of Skye in Scotland. It was researchers at Edinburgh University who discovered the tracks, which were made by sauropods more than 170 million years ago. Our science reporter, Victoria Gill, has been to Skye to find out more. It's a landscape that legend has it was shaped by giants. And while there are many myths inspired by the drama of this island, its coast has been hiding evidence left by real prehistoric beasts. A huge dinosaur, and I guess it would have yeah, compacted all of these sediments. It was on this bay that paleontologists, at the end of a day's fossil hunting, noticed an unusual pattern in the rocks. As the light hit it at the right angle, it just kind of clicked that something was, was odd about these things. And we had seen things like this before because we study dinosaurs, so we realized that these were dinosaur footprints. What looks like four rock pools in front of me are actually prehistoric footprints. So each one of these circular indentations was made by the foot of a sauropod. Those are those trunk-legged, long-necked giants, and they used to roam here 170 million years ago. What researchers stumbled on here is the most extensive dinosaur site in Scotland, a trackway of more than 100 footprints left behind by some of the biggest of the dinosaurs. These are a record of real dinosaurs living and moving around right here. And so we can tell a lot about how big they were, about how they moved, about what environments they lived in. What do we see there? Tiny little 
baby footprints. At the museum in Staffin, just a few miles from the site, Doogie Ross has curated a collection of Skye's Jurassic treasures. He's been exploring and fossil hunting here most of his life, but even he didn't expect a discovery of this scale. At most, I expected them to find a few fragmentary bits of fossilized bone. So when, when they first announced that, I, I thought, oh, they're just having me on. But gladly, <laughs> that was not the case. That was a genuine find. I was absolutely amazed. It's the pattern of prints that allows experts to walk with the dinosaurs. We're in a zigzag kind of rope. The experts are now calling this Scotland's Dinosaur Island. And as they continue to race the tides to work here, they expect its rocks to reveal more of their prehistoric secrets. Victoria Gill, BBC News on the Isle of Skye. Fabulous discovery. Now, before we go, it was a pretty important day for Facebook's founder, Mark Zuckerberg, and his wife, Priscilla. The couple welcomed their first child, a daughter named Max, into the world, and they also pledged 99% of their Facebook shares to charity during the course of their lives. That comes out to 45 billion, yes, 45 billion dollars, making it one of the largest such pledges in history. Congratulations to the Zuckerbergs and to all of those people who will be the recipients of all of that money. That brings the program to a close. You can, of course, find out much more of the day's news on our website. From me and the BBC team here, I'm Cathy Kay. Thanks so much for watching. Do tune in tomorrow. Make sense of international news at bbc.com slash news. Funding of this presentation is made possible by the Freeman Foundation, Newman's Own Foundation, giving all profits from Newman's Own to charity and pursuing the common good, Kovler Foundation, pursuing solutions for America's neglected needs, and Hong Kong Tourism Board. Tell me, sweet little love, Want to know Hong Kong's know most romantic spots? I'll show you. I love heading to Repulse Bay for an evening stroll. It's a perfect, stunning backdrop for making romantic moments utterly unforgettable. I've lived in this city for years, but Hong Kong still makes me fall in love with it time and again. BBC World News was presented by KCET Los Angeles. Next time on the PBS Arts Fall Festival. From the heart of Hollywood, Andrea Bocelli sings timeless songs from the movies. Celebrate the music of film and the power of a beloved singer. Great Performances presents Andrea Bocelli Cinema, Friday, November 27th at 9, 8 central, only on PBS. Join us for Josh Groban Stages Live, featuring his favorite Broadway music. If you want to see Magic Land, bring him home. With special guest, Kelly Clarkson. Anywhere you go, let me go Don't miss Josh Groban Stages Live. Arts and culture need to be viewed as essential elements of a community. The Community Idea Stations is a huge champion of arts and culture. I love the uh, three words that the Community Idea Stations uses, educate, entertain, and inspire, and that's precisely the things that arts and culture do. The programming helps us understand our world, helps us know more about where we're living, and all of that makes it so much easier to relate to other people and to have good friendships, and that makes our lives better. Membership for the Community Idea Stations and for all public broadcasting, I think, is vital. The way for this to exist, the way for these broadcasts to come into our homes is for us to help fund it.
Start pulling your costume together and join fellow Downton Abbey fans on Saturday, January 2nd at 8 p.m. for the last Downton Abbey preview celebration. Enjoy Downton Abbey on the big screen at the Altria Theater. Start the celebration early at our Speak Easy style reception in the Grand Ballroom. For more information, go to ideastations.org.